uh, meeting are available up here on the table. And also the sign-up sheet, if you didn't sign in, we'd like to know who was here. Uh, I guess this would come under old business. Um, Virginia Baker, who has served on our board for several years, has resigned. And due to that fact, tonight we have appointed Jim Duvall as her replacement, and he has graciously accepted that position, so he will be serving on your board. Uh, do we know of any other old business? How about new business, Virginia? I think you had something. I had something here. <coughs> we have always in the past taken part in the tree lighting here with the city, and I have gotten the information on that. It's going to be Tuesday, December the 6th at 6 to 8 p.m. And as we've always done it, I think it would be good if we went ahead and had it a, again. And I volunteer that I'll get the candy and I'll man the booth. If somebody else wants to help me, I'll be glad to have them. And uh, we always sell our books. So I just give that out to the, the if everybody's agreeable, if it's, they don't. Does anybody they would agree with that? How can you turn down a volunteer? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> would anyone like to volunteer to help her? Other than that man sitting next to her that yes. always gets he always, I always right. <laughs> <laughs> And I guess uh, you'll need access to some of the books prior to that, yes, right? Yes, I'll have the city. Okay. Yeah, I've talked to Vanessa, and she's going to make arrangements. And we will also have our uh, big banner that oh, says okay. Historical Society. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you both for volunteering. <clears throat> okay, is there any other new business to be brought before the membership? If not, uh, I've met our speaker tonight, but I had not previously. But my grass, I believe, was a fellow student. We figure out how old we both are, maybe. So, Mike, if you would like to come and introduce our speaker, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> I don't think I, we haven't seen each other since I graduated. He was still another year in band at Boone County High School, where he played the baritone right. very well. You were, you were <laughs> years ahead of me, right? Yes. And, uh, of course, his families have been down on the river farming for a great part of Boone County's history. And I think we're privileged to have you speak to us tonight. Well, thank you. I've got a few things here that we've collected over the years with my grandmother and my grandfather and my mother. So when it's all over, you can come and look at some of this and hear some of the, we were big in tours for kids. And here's some of the little thank yous we got from them. And I'm sure most of you know about this book of Northern Kentucky, Kentucky that Linda Hughes drew the pictures for. Well, this is, this is a picture, and it's a little story about that. She wanted an original drawing, and she had given me a copy of the original drawing for this book. And it was this picture right here, and it's in this book. And the little article that went along with it. Well, I'm not the best speaker in the world, but somehow I always manage to get it done. Uh, as uh, Virginia had asked me to do a uh, story on the hemp flings farming on the North Bend Bottoms, and in order to do it, I think probably I have written three or four of these, and I always, when I'm finished, I take them to my wife, who is an attorney and a school teacher, and she is a much better writer than I am, and she always rewrites them and makes them sound something a little bit coherent. So in the process of this one, she told me this was the last one, so I'm glad November the 17th got here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> in 1914, my grandfather, C.L. Hempfling, so that would be Charles, and my great-grandfather, C.O., 
they always called him CO, and I, you know, that's the way we'll refer to him tonight. Purchased the Webb Estate, which was at that time called Webb Hall, consisting of about 270 acres on the banks of the Ohio River in Boone County, Kentucky, directly across from the across the river from Sailor Park. At the time of the purchase, there were about 100 acres suitable for raising corn, hay for the livestock on the farm. Much of the bottom land, as it was referred to, was under flood waters in spring and, will yet make it, and, was, and was wet, making it difficult to plant crops early. The debris left behind by the receding flood waters would often take weeks to clear from the fields. I can remember my father saying, if there was anything he wanted, when he was a kid, it was to have a piece of land that did not flood. <laughs> Thus, North Bend Bottoms came into existence. At this time, most of the tilling and hauling was accomplished by teams of mules. The, um, the story I got was from 24 mules down to 12 mules, down to 6 mules. So I don't know how many mules there were, but there must have been a few mules. <laughs> My grandfather did not purchase first tractor until 1939, when my father was nine years old. It was a John Deere purchased from the Janssen Hardware and Plumbing Co Company in Covington. Despite the difficulties of farming in the flooded river bottom land, it soon became evident that the higher elevations and ridge tops were very suitable for growing fruit trees. In the mid-30s, orchards were introduced on the farm and were a great success early on. The Hemflings were already somewhat well known for growing big red apples, and if you remember the 1930, well, you don't have to remember, but if you've seen it, the 1930 edition of the recorder, it talks about Liston, which was my grandfather's brother, raising big red apples in the valley. And <clears throat> anyway, they had, a, they had a kind of a history of this already. My grandfather and my father would later tell the stories about how they developed their own pesticides to spray their fruit trees. There were no regulations or application permits in those days. With the success of the orchard business, it soon became apparent that there was not enough land to grow enough fruit to satisfy the demand in the Cincinnati market where all the fruit was transported and sold. My grandfather decided that in order to reach the optimum potential of fruit production for his existing farm, he would need to acquire additional land, thus North Bend Bottoms. This was before the days of the early killing spring freezes. And the reason I put that in there, if any of you know anything about the fruit business, there was a time in the history where the spring freezes was not a big a problem as it was in most of my lifetime. My grandfather started investigating land in the North Bend area to purchase. He settled on part of the Chrysler farm in North Bend Bottoms, about three miles downriver from Webb Hall and directly across the river from William Henry Harrison's tomb. If you sit on my front porch, you can see the tomb perfectly in the wintertime when the leaves are off. The 200 plus acre farm, part of the Chrysler farm he purchased in the mid 1940s eventually became the backbone of the family's fruit operation. When this land was purchased, it was run down and planted in wheat, which my father said was not worth harvesting, however the wheat was harvested. I think my grandfather, who did not believe in wasting anything, may have had something to do with this. The next spring, the farm, down the road as it was often called, began to process, <coughs> began the process of transformation to the biggest orchard in the area at the time. There were 20 plus acres of peaches and about the same number of acres planted in apples. Livestock would continue to play an important part in the farm's operation for several years. The hills above the orchards at Webb Hall would supply dairy operations with heifers and milking heifers for milking and calves to sell or to keep for future breeding. Hogs were raised and sold either as feeder pigs or finished hogs for the markets in Cincinnati. However, the Hemflings were already becoming known for their apple production not only in Boone County but throughout the state. This trend would continue for several years. By the 1950s, two more farms were added to the acreage at the farm down the road. There were about 100 acres of apples and 100 acres of peaches, which had become a great cash crop under cultivation. Late in the 50s, my grandfather was developing health problems, and my father was assuming responsibility for the major farm operation. 
It was about this time that there was a noticeable change in the Cincinnati fruit market. There was a sort of rapid decrease in demand for local fruit, resulting from increased competition from other states. The commodity on the wholesale market was increasing, and of course, the result was a sharp decrease in prices. And <clears throat> the reason I put that in there, my dad told me that when they first started harvesting apples on the Cropper farm, which is the farm that I live on, that um, Judge Cropper, that was his family, uh, Mr. Chrysler's grandmother, uh, they would get $5 a bushel for apples in Cincinnati. And when I was a kid, I can remember him coming home. And to say the least, if you know much about the hemflings, they've been known to cuss a little bit now. <laughs> they were getting 350 And they were terribly upset over this because they, they, they didn't know what to do. It was apparent, apparent and that significant changes would have to be made if the farm was to continue as a successful and profitable operation. The decisions my father made at the time in the farm's history turned out to be innovative and revolutionary in the business. Taking what was a real risk at the time, Dad decided to take a new approach to marketing his product. He decided to sell directly from the big barn on the original farm, which was used for grading and packing apples and peaches. My grandfather was not supportive of this concept until he began to see the profits, could see the profits could actually be made without shipping and selling the fruit across the river. That was a big thing. I can even remember as a little kid, they didn't have fights, but they sure had disagreements over how much was going to Cincinnati. This started a whole new income strategy based on a marketing concept that is now known as direct marketing. So actually, and I'm not saying this just to, to brag on my family, but my father was doing a lot of this 50 years ago or more. And now they've got, actually got names for it and different people take credit for it and these old guys, they just, along with Von Hemfling, they, they all worked together. Uh, they didn't very much agree together, but they did work together somewhat. <laughs> but it was, a, it, was a, it was a bittersweet relationship most of my life. In the 60s, the original farm was named Valley Orchards, and the farm down the road became known as Valley Orchards No. 2. With the continued success of the farm market and the introduction of the Pick Your Own concept, and in an attempt to keep the large clientele from Cincinnati, the farm started growing. This is where they started adding different crops in, in a major way. Nectarines, plums, apricots, strawberries, black raspberries, more varieties of apples and peaches, and a great selection of vegetables. In the 70s, the entire operation was thriving. The dairy herd had been sold, and the dairy barn turned into a large grading, packing, and market facility. Valley Orchards No. 2 was now the heartbeat of fruit and vegetable production for the operation. Also, the hog production was being phased out. Greenhouse tomatoes, bedding plants, and hanging baskets were added to the operation. In spite of the years of success, Mother Nature struck some serious blows to the form of in the form of early spring killing freezes, every fruit grower's worst nightmare. These freezes could wipe out an entire peach crop and much of an apple crop. And there were many times I can remember going to bed and my father saying, the, we got a good peach crop, and we'll see what happens in the morning. And the next morning, there was no peach crop. Once again, it was time to consider alternative sources of farm income. In the late 70s, it was decided that to help offset the losses from the fruit crop freeze, we would add shipping potatoes to the list of crops. At the time, this was a good crop to invest in. The sandy loam fields of Valley Orchards No. 2 would, out would outproduce any in the state for potatoes yielding up to 400 hundred weight per acre for some varieties. The average in the U.S. when I was on the National Potato Board and represented Kentucky was 200. Fortunately, there was a production window of opportunity that we could adapt to the growing season in Kentucky. In order to select the best varieties to grow in our area, the University of Kentucky Department of Horticulture, under the direction of C.R. Roberts, was able to conduct variety trials on our farm to try to match us up with good shipping potatoes. These, these trials yielded valuable results, which were used in the selection of correct cultivars to be sold to Frito-Lay and other chipping companies. We sold to, Frito-Lay was our big one. We sold to Hussman's, 
We sold to Mike Sells. We sold to, I think it was 20 states in the eastern part of the U.S. is where we sent potatoes to. We sold over two and a half million pounds in one year. During this time period, our farm was fortunate to be chosen by the Procter & Gamble Company to assist them with various chipping varieties of potatoes that were used in research, the outcome of which led to the manufacture of Pringles. During those years, the farm got lots of publicity because of willingness to think innovatively and take calculated risk. In the 1980s, we again needed to make some changes, which led to the purchase of property and development of the direct marketing outlet for our produce in Florence, Kentucky, which was called Valley Orchards Farm Market, which was just down the street. This was a very successful enterprise for several years, but with the advent of the Superstore and the stiff competition of this, the decision was made to sell the property when a good business opportunity arose. And my dad, he was always pretty shrewd at getting those big, good business ones. <laughs> As the years passed, it became evident that it was no longer economically feasible to continue full operation of Valley Orchards. Eventually, heartbreaking as it was, Valley Orchards became part of our past. Approximately 80 acres of the original Valley Orchards now belongs to Boone County and will be developed as a riverfront park. It will retain its name Valley Orchards. My wife and I own 100 plus acres of the Valley Orchards number two farm. We live in the Kirtley house named for Robert Reverend Robert E. Kirtley. The house was built in the 1830s. It is on the National Registry of Historic Places. Thank you. I have a little film, and I used to be asked to do this a lot, and I actually had it memorized, and I could actually look at the crowd. <laughs> but this is a new one, so I apologize. But this film, as it played, as it, as it went through its, the, the entirety, I would have, and I would try to um, match it up to everything that was happening. So I'm going to do that this time verbally and probably not do very well. But, and then when, it's, when we're finished with that, any of you that want to come here and look at some of these clippings that my grandmother, my grandfather, and my mother, and myself have cut out over the years, you're welcome to. And, um, That'll be it. Why do we need these? to dim the lights? Yes. Okay. You know how these old things are. If it doesn't blow up, we have it made. <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, I'll put my hand on the right contraption here.
This is inside the barn, and this is a part that my dad uh, fixed up for the market. And this is a bad spot. I don't remember this, but it shows that what, what it was showing was how we put them in bags instead of baskets. Baskets were up to a dollar and a quarter at that point. And this, this bag, we were buying for 35 cents. So we could keep our apples about the same price. And um, I hope this doesn't go on like that. Oh, this is down on Valley Orchards number two. And this is North Bend Bottoms. And this is right across the road from my house. And this is potato field. Here's my house. Directly over my shoulder would be the tomb of William Henry Harrison. And the reason for this was to show people how we actually cultivated the potatoes. At this particular time, I had 100 acres. I had varieties. You'll get to see some of them. They're round as balls, but that's what we needed for um, chipping varieties. They wanted something that would go through the peelers like this and turn, come out a round ball for a potato chip. This is a sprayer that we have used to spray. I could spray a whole hundred acres in a day, which I really couldn't do before. This is one of my favorite potatoes. That is called Superior. We brought it down here from Michigan. We grew it two years in the test plot. And we yielded 400 hundredweight per acre, and I sent those potatoes all over the United States, east of the Mississippi. And we would send out two 50,000 pound loads of potatoes a day, and you'll get to see us loading one of those trucks in a few minutes. But I like that potato because it bloomed pretty. It had a beautiful.